What I wanted to preach on tonight is just this topic of in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, I've just been thinking about it a lot, just with the whole uh, you know, issue about modalism and all that stuff that came up. Um, and this has kind of been you know, thrown into the mix, but I think it's actually something, that, that it's a topic that is actually separate from it, even though it's somewhat related. So tonight's sermon is just going to be about, you know, when we, when, when we baptize people, what should be the words that we say? Um, and what, what is the practice that we see in the New Testament? And how do we explain, obviously, why we say what we say? Now, so that's going to be the title of the sermon, In the Name of Jesus Christ. Now, if this is Matthew 28, so let's just read this, because this is basically the passage. If you were to ask somebody, you know, why do they say what they say when they baptize somebody? This is really the passage that everyone goes to. This is the reason why, you know, I've always done it this way. Um, and, you know, what, what has been traditionally done, right? But then, after I go through this sermon, you'll see, I don't think it actually fits with what we actually see the apostles doing. And I think there's another explanation for why this passage is phrased the way it does, um, phrased the way it is. So in Matthew 28, it says here, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So that's the common practice, right? The common practice that, you know, I guess not every Christian does it that way. But, and some Christians don't even say anything, right? When they baptize people, they just say they baptize them. Um, and then they just might, you know, because if you think about it, when John the Baptist came, what was he saying? Right? I mean, nobody really knows what John the Baptist was saying when he baptized people. We only know what he was saying was probably he was pointing people to Jesus, right? He was talking about that there cometh one after me, you know, that the, whose shoes latch and I'm not even worthy to unloose, and he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And we even see, we'll see later in Acts 19, that he baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. So it's not until here that we get Jesus saying this, and this is where people get this common practice. And I haven't really looked into the history of it, but you know, I've read certain things where people say, like in the early centuries, it was the Catholic Church that added this, um, this the way, the things that they say when they baptize people. And, and before that, the church was just doing it in the name of Jesus. Um, but I don't know, because that's history, right? So I'm not going to base my position on history. I'm going to base my position on what I see on Scripture. But sometimes history is just interesting to know. So this is the verse. So if you were to ask somebody, you know, when you baptize somebody, why do you say, I'm baptizing you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost? This is really the verse that they will go to. And the argument is basically, you know, that's the, the clear command of Jesus Christ before he ascended. So why would you ever question it? But see, the problem is, is when we try and fit that interpretation of this passage to the rest of scripture. And this is what I'm going to show you tonight and, and why I think what really should be said when we baptize somebody is that they are baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as opposed to the name of the Father, Son and Holy Ghost. Um, so that's really the position I'm making a case for today, that when a person is baptized, what we ought to say, if we say anything at all, um, because obviously you don't need to say anything when you baptize people. Like, you know, if you were baptizing like a hundred people, you might not really say anything. You might just baptize them uh, one after another. So what we ought to say, if we say anything at all, is that, we are, that, is that they are being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, remember, when I teach on baptism, and I've taught on baptism a couple of times in the past, I usually talk about baptism when, I, when we have a baptism, right? that what I believe makes a baptism valid is that the person who is being baptized is saved and they are baptized by immersion. Um, and that they are, obviously, that they are, they are baptized, I, I believe, in the, in the name of Jesus or in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And I'll explain why I think these are the same things, uh, that they actually mean the same things, but I think what we see, the practice in Acts, is them actually saying the words in the name of Jesus. So it's not like whether somebody says in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, that's valid. And if somebody says in the name of Jesus, that's not valid and vice versa. It's not like one invalidates the other. So it's not that if somebody is baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, they need to get rebaptized because they weren't baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost and likewise vice versa. So that's not what makes your baptism valid because either way, 
what my position is they believe they they mean the same things it's just what you're going to say when you actually baptize somebody um yeah and what they say does not validate your baptism or or, or invalidate your baptism so that's the position I'm, I'm making a case for today now i do want to make a strong point because i i, I wonder if uh, the, you know when people hear this sermon or even you're wondering right now um, when we talk about hey when you're baptized you say in the name of the lord jesus christ instead of in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost that might be a buzzword for people where they just go ah you know you believe in modalism you believe in oneness and that's kind of how it's been painted you know by you know stephen anderson by these people that are really against modalism and oneness which i am as well because obviously that you know that uh that god only wears one hat at a time and they're not eternal they're not coexisting you know that is heresy um but i want to show you because one thing that uh, you know stephen anderson did say through all this is that this is a hallmark sign of oneness or modalism but you can believe that the right thing to say when you baptize somebody is i baptize you in the name of the lord jesus christ without believing oneness without believing modalism these two things they they are not intrinsically linked right now i understand that if somebody does believe oneness if somebody does believe modalism they would follow that practice and for them it's reasonable and it makes sense as well but that doesn't mean that somebody who does the practice believes modalism or believes oneness it's kind of like the trinity right trinity the trinity you, most catholics believe the trinity but the trinity is not intrinsically linked to catholicism if you believe in the trinity that doesn't make you a catholic does that make sense so it's the same with this somebody can make a case for saying hey what you should be saying and what we see in the bible people saying is baptizing them in the name of the lord jesus christ but that doesn't mean they believe modalism right because you can argue it argue it from different points of view so there's really two main arguments right uh, for somebody that doesn't say the words when they baptize somebody in the name of the father and of the son of the holy ghost if they say the words in the name of the lord jesus christ uh, as opposed to in the name of the father son holy ghost there's really two ways to argue it right one argument which is not the argument that i'm making today and i i you know I, i'm kind of undecided on it but the first argument it was the argument that tyler baker made right the, the argument that tyler baker made was that the bible says here it's in the name singular of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost and basically the argument was well what is that singular name if there is one name that represents the father the son and the holy ghost what would that name be and the logical conclusion is what well, that name would be jesus right the name that is above every name and then he says well because that's the name you know you are baptizing in that singular name when you say the father the son and the holy ghost you're just not saying the name that it is and that's jesus right so that's one one way you can argue it and you know i'm not i'm not saying necessarily they do, that i don't agree with that i got to study that out a bit more but that's not the case i'm going to make today I, I believe that there is another way that you can argue this point and still believe that the right practice is to say in the name of the lord jesus christ without believing that the name of the father is jesus and the name of the son is jesus and the name of the holy ghost is jesus and therefore that's why you do it so that's the first argument the first argument is that there's a singular name that that name is jesus and jesus is the name of all three persons in the trinity and therefore that's why when you baptize in the name of jesus you are baptizing in the name of the father and the son and the holy ghost so that's one argument that's not the argument that i'm making today um, and i don't even 100 percent know whether i support that argument yet now the second argument and and really because the problem people have with baptizing in the name of the father the son holy ghost and we're going to look at these passages in acts is if it was so clear jesus's command to baptize in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy ghost right and those were the words you ought to be saying then the question is why immediately after his ascension you know after the day of pentecost he's gone and then we see what the apostles were doing why did why did none of them do it and why do all the cases where people are baptized and they're told we're told the name that they were baptized in was in the name of jesus it just kind of it just raises that red flag doesn't it if that is so clear and this is the why reason why we've just been doing what we're doing not questioning it why did the apostles not do it that way right and then the answer was basically well it's because what you should be saying is here in matthew 28 
right? In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. But in Acts, when it says in the name of the Lord Jesus, it doesn't actually mean that's the name that you're saying and that's the name that you're baptizing by. The argument is basically that in the name, that phrase doesn't mean this is the name you say. They're saying in the name means this is the authority by which you are baptizing. And that's kind of the explanation for people to keep baptizing, saying in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, because they say, well, there's no contradiction, right? Even though Acts is very clear that, and I'll show you there is actually four mentions of them baptizing in the name of the Lord, right? Even though we see this practice and we see this example four times, their explanation is basically what you're saying should be this, and what Acts is saying is that they are just doing this, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, but Acts is just describing it by the authority of Jesus and saying, in the name of Jesus. Now, what's interesting about that argument is that that argument does not actually support one view or the other, right? Because if somebody says, well, my view is, my position is, you should say in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and then I explain I explain the four examples I see in Acts as, well, in the name of doesn't mean the name that you say, it just means the authority by which you do it, and therefore I can keep saying in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and that's how I explain those verses. That position, that explanation actually works both ways. And what do I mean by that? Meaning, if my position is what you should say, right, is I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus, right, then we can go back to Matthew 28 and still understand this. There's no contradiction here. It still all makes perfect sense that what Jesus is saying here is that you need to baptize them by the authority of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Does that make sense? So you see how like the position, you know, the explanation of in the name of meaning by the authority of actually works for both positions because you can say, well, I'm baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And why didn't the apostles do it that way? Because they're just doing it by the authority of Jesus. Or you can take the position, well, this is what the apostles did, and this is what we are told they, they did, and why did they just, you know, why does it seem like they just totally ignored supposedly this clear command? And your position is, well, I'm going to do what they did, right, as my example, and say, I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And how do I explain this? I explain this by it's by the authority of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. But look at verse 18. Verse 18 says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me. Right? So when we're saying we're baptizing by the authority of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, who has all that authority? Jesus, according to this verse. He's saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Right? And then verse 19 says, Go ye therefore. I was always taught whenever there's a therefore, they say, find out what it's there for, right? So why, why is he saying, go ye therefore? Well, the therefore is referring to verse 18, the fact that all power and all authority is given to him. So all authority, all power is given to Jesus. He says, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of in the authority or by the authority of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because he has all that authority. And that's why when you baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus, you are baptizing by his authority and his authority has the authority of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So that's the second argument, right? The second argument is, you know, that in the name of just means by the authority of, and this is why they say what they say in Acts. And, you know, and this is why, you know, you know, uh, Jesus saying here, all authority is given to him. He has the authority of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Uh, that's Jesus. So let's look at these verses that I, I, I told you about in Acts. We'll look at the four examples in Acts where they, the apostles are baptizing people and it clearly says in Acts that they are baptized in the name of the Lord as opposed to in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Um, Acts 2 is the first one. Now, this one, if you remember in Acts 2, it's the day of Pentecost. You know, this is the one where Peter stands up and he's just preaching and, and you know, supposedly 3,000 get saved and all that sort of thing. And I know the other view of that is, you know, the actual 150 or 120, is it, in the early church going about and all of them getting that 3,000 saved as opposed to this just one, uh, you know, great sermon that just uh, got everyone saved. But look at what he says here. So this is Acts 2. You think about it. You know, they're waiting for the promise of the Father. 
you know, because they're, they're in that upper room, they're waiting for that baptism of fire that comes and gives them tongues and they go out and they preach the gospel in all these different languages. So he's preaching here in the power of the Holy Ghost. And this is what he says, right? This is Acts 37. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Because he's already sort of told them, right? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So this is what shall we do on top of that, right? On top of actually getting saved. Verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now, obviously, that's not teaching that you get baptized, have your sins saved. That is saying that because our sins have been remitted, that's why we need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, I won't go into the gift of the Holy Ghost, maybe in another sermon where, you know, at the, at, I believe at the beginning when the church first started, this is how um, the baptism of the Holy Ghost manifested itself uh, very differently to how it does now. Because back then, you know, the word was not as sort of established. The New Testament was being preached. And we even see in, Math, you know, in Mark 16 where they did these signs to confirm the word. So there was a purpose for these signs, right? There was a purpose for tongues in order to preach the gospel to other nations. There was a purpose for these miracles to confirm that these people were of God. These people were preaching the word of God. But now that we have the word of God, that's why it doesn't happen anymore, right? That's why as we read through um, the epistles, and, and not even everybody had this baptism of fire, right? Like I, I've been talking to a Pentecostal recently, and I was saying, you know, you're saying that everybody that gets saved has to have this baptism of fire, has to have this baptism of the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues. But not even in the Bible, you have everybody that gets saved being baptized by the Holy Ghost in the way they understand it, right? Because remember the Ethiopian eunuch, you know, he didn't speak in tongues. Um, you know, uh, the house of Lydia, they didn't speak in tongues. The Philippian jailer's house, they didn't speak in tongues. So, you know, there's, there's got to be another understanding of, oh, this just happens to everybody. Even in 1 Corinthians 12, it says that not everybody, you know, not everybody has these gifts and we should be striving for charity um, because it's not just something that happens to everybody. And even as we read through the New Testament epistles, we see people having sicknesses, having illnesses, right? Now, if Paul could heal people and cast out devils, why didn't he just heal Timothy? Why didn't he just heal Epaphras? Why didn't he just heal these people? It's because the, the healing, the gifts were there for a purpose, and I think we see in the New Testament them starting to fade away. Anyway, a bit off topic there. But we see here, this is just a clear statement here. Why didn't he say here, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost? If that's so clearly what Jesus commanded them to do. It's, I mean, this is right after, right? This is like a couple of months later. They're in there at the day of Pentecost, you know, and then Jesus has already told, told them, uh, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Why, when he's filled with the Holy Ghost, he stands up at the day of Pentecost and he preaches and says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Why would he say that? You know, if, if the right way to do it you know, is to say in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. I mean, does that, doesn't that make you wonder at all? Like, surely the people that believe the Scriptures, they look to the New Testament, they look to the Acts of the Apostles to see how the church should be doing things, would wonder why, if Jesus said, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, is Peter saying here, baptize every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ? Acts 8 is another one. When they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ. Every time I, this, this is why, this is emphasized so many times in the New Testament, just the name of Jesus Christ, right? Because that's the name that we ought to be glorifying. That's the name that is above every name. That's the name that we want people to know. And that's why it's just all throughout the New Testament that you may not even realize, right? So I'm just, I just underlined, every time I go to these passages, I'm just underlining it, just so you can see. The name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and the signs which were done. So if you remember, Philip's in Samaria, and there was a Simon the sorcerer who was bewitching the people, and then he ended up getting saved, right? And then he tried to buy the gift of the Holy Ghost. It says here, now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto, unto them Peter and John. So, right, so Philip's in Samaria, he's preaching the gospel, people are getting saved, and then Jerusalem hears about it, so they say, hey, we're going to send Peter and John down there. 
who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. So you see here at the beginning, not everybody was being baptized by the Holy Ghost at the point they were saved. You know, sometimes people, it just fell on them. Sometimes they needed to have their hands laid on them. I believe now that this, I guess, apostolic time has passed, that, you know, baptism of the Holy Ghost happens when you're saved. This is what I believe, that happens when you're saved, but it doesn't necessarily manifest now in these great signs and wonders, right? But the baptism of the Holy Ghost is what adds you to the universal body of Christ, right? So there's a universal body, but there isn't a universal church. There are independent churches. Um, so who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Look at this. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, why would, why would the Holy Ghost authoring Acts say this if they were all baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, right? Um, and I, like I said, there is that argument where you can say, well, they're just doing it by the authority of Jesus, right? But I think as we go on through this sermon, you'll see, I think that's a weaker position than the position of you should be saying in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Matthew 28 is showing us that Jesus has the authority of the Godhead. And that's why when we baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus, we baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Let's keep going. Acts 10. Another example here. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, which name is that? The name of the Lord Jesus. Whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Right? And what name is that? That name is Jesus, right? The name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So it again, Acts makes the point here that they're not baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. They're baptized in the name of the Lord, which is consistent with the two that we've already seen. Now, the last one here is in Acts 19, where it says here, where Paul basically uh, finds these people that are trying to follow Jesus, right? They're disciples, but they're not actually saved yet. They're just following Jesus, um, but they're not, they're trying to follow Jesus, but they're not actually saved. They don't actually uh, even know about the Holy Ghost. And it says here, and it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. So this is a red flag, obviously, right? Because even uh, John the Baptist was preaching about the Holy Ghost, right? Saying that there cometh the one after me, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And this is why he says, un he says to them, and he says unto them, unto what then were ye baptized? So he's not referring here to what name were you baptized by. He's asking, well, then who baptized you, right? Because Everybody knew that you're getting baptized and what does the baptism of water represent? It represents the baptism of the Holy Ghost that is coming later. When Jesus comes, he says, I remember John said, I baptize with you with water, but he that cometh after me, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So he's kind of like, well, who's baptized you if you don't even know about the Holy Ghost? Because that's what's happening. You know, people are getting baptized and then they're receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. And that's what Jesus uh, told us about. That's what John told us about. And he says, he said unto them, unto what then were you baptized? And they said, unto John's baptism. So they actually were baptized by John, but then they weren't actually saved, right? Because they didn't actually know what they were saying. Then Paul uh, um, clarifies, right? So it's, then said Paul, John verily baptized, verily means truly, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people. So people, a lot of people believe that John the Baptist preached, repent of your sins to be saved. You know, that the baptism of repentance was stop sinning and turn to God, turn away from your, your sins and, and, and be saved. No, we actually are told here by Paul what the baptism of repentance is. Saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. Right? So we know that John the Baptist definitely did not say, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Why? 
because he died before Jesus even gave the command to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Right? He was beheaded in prison. So, you know, even I think even that's a point to dwell on. That when John the Baptist baptized people, whose name do you think he was pointing people to? He was pointing them to Jesus Christ. He, that's the name he was glorifying. That's the name that he wanted people to know because that's what baptism is, right? Baptism is this public testimony of you being saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. So if I'm going to baptize somebody and make that a public witness, why would we glorify any other name than the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Doesn't that make sense? And even John, I believe, probably would have said that too, because he's even saying here that John baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So again, saying here, well, what were you about by John's about? Well, John pointed people to Jesus and then he says, once they heard this, so now they're saved, right? They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, not in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So that's what we see described in acts right which is really what raises the question of well if jesus said baptize in the name of the father son holy ghost why are the apostles doing why why is acts describing them as doing it in the name of jesus is it because they're just doing it by the authority of jesus or is matthew 28 that jesus is saying i have the authority of the father son holy ghost therefore go baptize and you baptize in my name Therefore, you will be baptizing by the authority of the Godhead. So that's what is described in Acts. Let's now have a look at what is actually said in Acts. Right? Where we look at examples of when the apostles did something and they proclaimed that they were doing it by the name of somebody, right? What did they say? Right? So let's look at Acts 3. So now we're past Acts 2 after the day of Pentecost, and this is where the the person that couldn't walk was sitting outside the beautiful gate and he gets healed by Peter. It says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour, and a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them, right? So he's, they're walking up to this guy, he's asking for, for money, and they're saying, you know, look on us, and he looks up at them. And he's expecting now to receive something. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So I understand that this has nothing to do with baptism, but what I'm just trying to show you here is that when the apostles did do something and wanted to proclaim by what authority or by, why, by what power they were doing something, they actually said, in the name of Jesus Christ. So if you think, if somebody takes the view that in Acts it's just saying that they were doing it by the authority of Jesus, but then we have examples in Acts where they did things by the authority of Jesus and they, that's what they said as well. So why would I think it's different for the other passages? Does that make sense? The only reason why I think it's different is because of Matthew 28. But if Matthew 28 has an explanation that it's by the authority of, then, then there's no contradiction there. There's no problem there. And then I don't have to sort of like play this mental gymnastics with Acts, right? Of, you know, why do they keep saying it? they're doing it in the name of Jesus when they're not really? They're doing it in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Um, but, but Acts is describing it that way. When they do other things like this in the name of Jesus, they are saying in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Nazareth what rise up and walk. So it, it's perfectly consistent that when the Bible describes them doing something in the, in, in the, in the, in the, by the authority of Jesus, that is also what they're saying. Um, and I won't read verse 7. All right, let's go on to Acts uh, 3. Let's say let's just show a bit later. So I, I just skipped over a couple of passages uh, from verse 7 down to verse 12 as we get back to the story here. And it says, and when Peter saw it, because people were wondering, like, how was this person healed, right? And he says, and when Peter saw it, he answered, un answered unto the people, ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? He's saying, like, why are you shocked that this man is healed? Or why look ye so earnestly on us 
as though by our own power or holiness. So he's saying, why are you looking as though it's our own authority or our own holiness that healed this person? He says, no, uh, you know, we have made this man to walk. No, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus. Right? So they want to glorify Jesus Christ. That's why they're doing it by the authority of Jesus Christ. That's why they would say the name Jesus Christ, right? Because how are you glorifying the name of Jesus if, if you don't even want to say it when you're pronouncing to everybody by what power you're actually doing something? Whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life whom God hath raised from the dead whereof we are witnesses and his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him. Right? You see how he's, he's trying to magnify the name. He's trying to glorify Jesus. It's all about Jesus' name. It's all about him. Hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Let's go to Acts 16. Acts 16 is where Paul, uh, you know, he's being followed by this demon-possessed woman, right? That is actually praising them for being the servants of God, but he eventually has to rebuke her, right? Because she's demon-possessed. It says, And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. So she was demon-possessed. She was saying all these different things and, and, and the, the people that she belonged to were making a lot of money off this demon-possessed woman. The same followed Paul and us, right? Because the, who wrote Acts? Luke wrote Acts, right? So Luke was traveling with Paul. That's why you can say he's, it's us. And cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which showed unto us, which show unto us, the way of salvation. So you see, she's saying like the right things, right? That's why it says the devils be that believe, you know, thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. The devils believe, also believe and tremble. The devils also know what the truth is, right? They, and they also believe that there is one God. They know who Jesus was. They just can't be saved. Um, verse 18, it says, And this did she many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. So the point I'm trying to make here is, you know, we have the examples of them baptizing and it's described that they are baptizing them in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then we have a couple of examples in Acts where we see the, the situation where it's described where the apostles are actually proclaiming something and doing something. And what they're saying is, in the name of Jesus Christ. And what's interesting is if, if it's just those two examples, right? So in Acts 3, it was somebody that was sick, right? That was lame, that was healed. Acts 16 was somebody that was demon-possessed that was healed, and they're saying in the name of Jesus. And we actually compare this to the other places where the Great Commission is actually mentioned, right? Because the Great Commission in Matthew 28 is, Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing in the name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and Lord, I'm with you, uh, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever commanded you. Um, and so on and so forth. But if you look at um, other places in the Gospels where the uh, Great Commission is mentioned, you'll notice a few things as well that you may not have noticed before. But let's show, let me show you in Mark 16. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the Gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And if you remember, Paul was bitten by a serpent, so that's another example in Acts where this sort of took place. They shall lay their hands, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. I just think it was interesting that the two uh, situations that sort of where they're doing something and saying, I do this in the name of Jesus, are actually mentioned in Mark 16, where Paul actually casts out a devil. And then Peter heals that man that's, um, you know, standing, uh, sitting at the beautiful gate. So there is a link here, right? So he's telling them that they're going to do all these things in his name. Why would it be so crazy that they're also baptizing in his name as we see in the book of Acts? And therefore, the explanation for Matthew 28 is it's just by the authority of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost because Jesus has that authority. Now let's look at some other acts. I just want to sort of drive this point home and show you I don't know if you realize how many other things we actually do in the name of Jesus, 
right? Um, it just seems to be only baptism when we say, we don't say that. That's like the only thing that's like excluded for some reason um, because of Matthew 28. And I think there's an explanation. But let's just go through a couple of verses where we see many other things we do in the New Testament church uh, by the name of Jesus Christ. Um, Acts 4, I just wanted to read this passage, it's a bit long of a passage because it just goes on again from Acts 3 where we, we saw where Peter was explaining to the people, right? Explaining to them by what power this man was healed. Acts 4 is when he's brought before the high priest, right? He's brought before like these, these, uh, these judges and whatnot and now they're questioning him. And he says, and when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Right? So they're saying, what authority, what name have you done this act? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. So you see how they're, they're, they're not backing down at all. They're, they're, they're making it very clear that the name, the person that they are trying to magnify is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the stone which was set at naught of you, you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So that's my first example, is that the fact that we are saved by the name of Jesus Christ. So isn't it just interesting that, you know, why in Acts, like, you know, that's what they're saying, the power they do it by, that's the name they're doing everything by, that's what they're saying, that's what it describes that they're baptizing people by, but for some reason we have this idea that they're baptizing and saying in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, and we're getting that from Matthew 28. And I, I'm sorry if I'm just sort of repeating that, but that's just the point, right? The point is that the explanation to Matthew 28 is just they're doing it by the authority of, but what they're actually saying and what they're actually telling people they're doing is they're doing it by the name of Jesus. So Acts 4 shows that's the name that we're saved by. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And that's, that's always a great passage, right? I, I love that passage at the end because it shows that God can use people. God doesn't have to use an eloquent person. He doesn't have to use this genius, these, the, the people in the world that, that are recognized out there. That's not necessarily who God is using, right? He's just using working class men that were fishermen. Even here it says they, they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. Even from the world's point of view, they just thought, hey, these people are uneducated. But they could at least tell that these people knew the Bible they had been with Jesus. That's sort of the testimony that you want. You don't necessarily have to be this great scholar or this great speaker or this well-educated person. If you just know the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, and you study his word, you spend time with Jesus, God can use you, right? And that's what people are going to see. They're going to see, hey, you know, you're not, you don't have all these fancy titles or whatnot, but they know that you spend time with Jesus. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 6.11. It says, As such were some of you, Again, salvation, but you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Matthew 18, 20, when we gather for church, when we gather, what name do we gather under? Well, it says here in Matthew 18, 20, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So even church, we gather in the name of Jesus Christ. John 14, why when we pray, why is it common practice for, for us to say, we ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, amen? Because that's how we are told to pray. We ask, and whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So that's even an interesting point there, that we, when we do things in Jesus' name, the Father is glorified too. So it's not taking away from the Trinity. It's not taking away from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost when we baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because Jesus has all the authority and when we glorify Jesus Christ, we glorify the Father. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. 
So obviously that doesn't mean that, you know, it's not saying, you know, we're not saying that these words have any special power, right? When you pray, it's not like if you don't say it, your prayer is not going to get answered. It's just that that's why people end their prayer like that. That's why it's common practice for people to say, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. You know, we're asking these things, we're praying in Jesus' name, amen, because of John 14 and many other passages that talk about asking in his name. Look at this, even when we give thanks, right? When we praise God, and give him thanks for things. What does it say? Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you see how you give thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not taking away from giving thanks to the Father or giving thanks to God. Why? Because Jesus Christ is God, right? So it's his name, though, that is being glorified. It's his name that is above all names. Look at this, James 5.14. When we pray for those that are sick, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So again, the name of Jesus Christ. And look at this one. This one I think is a really powerful one in the sense of being baptized in the name of Jesus. This is a really interesting passage. Look at what it says here. Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. So what was happening in the Corinthian church? There was this cult of personality, right? You know, where people say, I'm of this person, you know, I'm of Victor, you know, I'm of whatever, and what, right? and, and sort of identifying themselves by, by the leaders rather than recognizing, no, 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 you are of Jesus Christ. Because what's the right, you know, there's four here, right? I of Paul, Paul, Apollos, Cephas, which is Peter, and Christ. Which one's the right one? It's Christ, right? That's the one you should be of, is of Christ, not of a man. So people were saying different things, right? The people that were right were the people that were saying, I of, I'm of Christ, because that's the right thing to be of. Verse 13, he says, is Christ divided? Right? So this is the context of what they're talking about, that we are of Christ, we are gathering in the name of Jesus, we do the things by Jesus Christ. He's saying, is Christ divided? No, right? Because we are all of Christ. But look at this. Then he compares himself to Jesus Christ. He says, was Paul crucified for you? No, Paul was not crucified for you, because who was crucified for you? Jesus Christ. Then he says, or oh, were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now, are we baptized in the name of Paul? No. But who should we be baptized in the name of? Now, he doesn't say here that we, he's not saying, but it's just a very strong implication, right? The strong implication here is that Paul wasn't crucified for you, you're not baptized in the name of Paul, but Jesus was crucified for you and you are baptized in the name of Jesus. Right? That's just... He says, I thank God that I baptized none of you... Oh, sorry, for you. Or were you... He says, was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. Right? So he's saying like... He's, I'm not baptizing in the name of Paul. What name is he baptizing people by, right? You say, well, he's baptizing them by the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. But then why is he talking about Christ? Why is he saying, was, Christ, was Paul crucified for you? No, Jesus was crucified for you, not the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Jesus Christ was crucified for you. And then he says, were well, you baptized in the name of Paul? Right? So it's, it's a little hard to get around this, right? That's, that's why, like, you know, and, and, and honestly, it's not even really a big point. Because I'm not saying that it's an invalid baptism if somebody baptizes by the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. I just like doing things right, right? Like if, if things are not done the right way, I like to change, do it the right way. And if the Bible's pretty clear that the thing I should be saying when I baptize people is I'm baptizing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that makes complete sense with everything we see in Scripture, then I don't see a problem with changing, right? You know, so um, that's why I have changed. Uh, I, baptize also, I baptize also the house of Stephanus besides... And I know not whether I baptized any other. And I'm preaching this sermon because obviously some of you want to be baptized. And I want you to know that my position has changed on this. So you're not freaked out that when we go to baptism, you're like, why is he not saying the Father, Son, Holy Ghost? I'm trying to explain it to you guys now so that you understand this. And then when we do the next baptism, those are the words I'm going to be saying. But um, obviously the meaning of it doesn't really make a difference, right? Because like I said, if you do it by the, if you say, I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
and you're doing it by the authority of Jesus Christ, Jesus has the authority of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So you are baptizing them also in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. But when somebody says, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost, it's not the practice we're seeing, and they're not magnifying and glorifying the Lord Jesus in that act, right? Everything else we do, we've gone through all these other things, right? Everything else we do, we glorify the name Jesus. We gather in the name of Jesus. We pray in the name of Jesus. We go by the name Christians, right? Because it's Jesus Christ. Why then, when I do a public thing like baptize somebody, would I also not want to glorify the name Jesus Christ and say, I baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? That just makes complete sense to me. And it's the name above every name, right? Wherefore God also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That means the name of Jesus is above the name of the Father, the name of, or the name of the Son is Jesus, right? The name of the Holy Ghost, if those are names, because that's one argument, right? That those are names and, and the Father is just a name that, that, that was manifested by Jesus Christ. Um, I, I don't accept that for one minute, but, but my point is that whatever names they have, if they have names, you know, obviously the Father has Jehovah and whatnot, that the name of Jesus is above all those names, right? So if I'm going to magnify a name when I do things, wouldn't I magnify the name that is above every name? Like God exalts the name above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Look at this one. This is a really interesting one, right? Ephesians 1, it says here, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, right? So it's Philippians 2. But look at this. Not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. So God is saying here that the name of Jesus is not only above every name that you know now, but it's above every name that will ever be, right? Every name, but also in that, not only in this world, but in the next world as well, right? In the, when we go into the millennium and the new heaven and the new earth, the name of Jesus Christ will still be the name above every name. Look at this passage in Colossians 3.17. Just sort of summing it up now, just uh, coming into a close, but... Even in Colossians 3, 17, whatsoever ye do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him, by, by, by Jesus Christ. So isn't that consistent? If the Bible's saying here, well, whatever you do, whether in word, whether it's by what, what you say or what you do, the Bible's saying here, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. So why, why would it be crazy if I'm going to baptize somebody, I'm doing it in deed, right? Because we're gathered in the name of Jesus. Wouldn't I also do it in word and say, I'm baptizing you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? I mean, that, that just makes complete sense to me, right? Giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Second Thessalonians 1, this is our purpose, right? Wherefore also we pray all, always for you that our God would count you worthy of his calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So what's the conclusion, right? And I'll just sum it up again. Number one, if Jesus is the, if Jesus is the name above every name, right? So if Jesus is the name above every name, if we are to do all in the name of Jesus... If we, like we read in 2 Thessalonians 1, we are to glorify the name Jesus in everything we do, why then, why then would it be weird or crazy or unorthodox for somebody when they baptize somebody to also proclaim that they're doing it in the name of Jesus, right? When, especially one, when, when it perfectly, it does, it perfectly fits Matthew 28. There's no contradiction with Matthew 28. If in the name of means by the authority of, because like I said, when you baptize by the authority of Jesus, you are baptizing by the authority of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And Jesus says, all power is given unto him. So 
There's no contradiction there. I, I can accept what Matthew 28 plainly says without then having to deny the examples we see in Acts. So why would it be unorthodox to give honour to that name in baptism? It fits Matthew 28. It's the example we see in Acts, both of what was described and also what the apostles said when they did things in the name of Jesus. So we see that it fits fine with Matthew 28. All power is given unto me. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And like I said, the example we see in Acts, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So I think there's a really strong case for it. Like I said, I don't actually think it makes a huge difference because I don't think somebody who baptizes and says in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, that that is an invalid baptism, that somebody needs to be rebaptized if they're not. And maybe the Pentecostals believe that, maybe the oneness and modalist people believe that. I don't know, right? But like I said, it's a small difference, but I think it's, it's worth explaining because um, I think when you make small changes like this, to traditions that are so, that are so like fervently, uh, uh, I guess, uh, supported, right, and preached, and and a lot of people, when you do small things like this, they they freak out. Rather than realizing and looking at the scriptures and realizing, hey, it's actually very reasonable. We do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. We glorify the name the name of the Lord Jesus. Why then would it be unorthodox to also baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus? when that is even what we read in Acts. That's what we read in Acts. Anyways, I hope you learned something. Um, if you have any questions about that, feel free to ask me afterwards. But let's just uh, close in prayer, and then we'll sing one more song. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, thank you that we can, you know, uh, nut out passages like this and that we can uh, learn. And, and Lord, uh, you know, that we can try and, uh, uh, try and have our church, Lord, uh, do it as close as possible as we see and what you reveal to us in the scriptures. So, Lord, give us wisdom. I pray, Lord, that, you know, we would never hold the tradition of man above the, the, the commandments that you have, that we would make your commandments of none effect by our tradition. Lord, I pray that we would uh, always examine every tradition and, Lord, just make sure that it lines up with your word. We thank you and, and we pray all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, let's sing uh, one more song. And then, uh, it's good, we're finishing a bit earlier these days. We're going to sing, Take the Name of Jesus With You. Just uh, reflect on the sermon that I just preached. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It will joy and comfort give you. Take it then where'er you go. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Take the name of Jesus ever as a shield from every snare. If temptations round you gather, breathe that holy name in prayer. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Oh, the precious name of Jesus, how it thrills our souls with joy. When his loving arms receives us and his songs our tongues employ. Precious name, oh, how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven.